In southern Italy, a haunting discovery adds an intimate human face to the story. Found in a cave in 1998, the remains of an infant who died around 17,000 years ago, known simply as Lemura I, were so well preserved that scientists reconstructed his likely features, a boy with curly dark brown hair, blue eyes, and medium brown skin. He was only seven months to one and half years old, and stood 82 centimeters tall. His remains, which were found beneath slabs of rock, were remarkably well preserved, astonishing considering their advanced age. Radiocarbon dating places them between 17,320 and 16,910 years old. Because of this, the researchers have been afforded a rare glimpse into the unfortunate infant's characteristics, development, health, death, and ancestry. What scientists learn from his DNA is astonishing. He suffered from a congenital heart defect, poor physical development, and signs of inbreeding. Clues to a small, isolated group struggling through the last throes of the last glacial maximum. Yet this small boy may hold the key to the peopling of Sicily and parts of southern Europe. Genetically, he was part of a wave of humans associated with the Epigravetian culture that spread from northeastern Italy through the peninsula and into the Mediterranean islands. This genetic stream different from earlier Gravettian groups, reshaped Italy's human landscape. Another ancient skeleton known as Tagliente II from northern Italy had very similar DNA to the baby from Grotta del Mura, including blue eyes. This suggests that the people of the Epigravettian culture may have arrived in Italy before 17,000 years ago, spreading quickly from the northeast down to the far south and even to Sicily. The infant from Lemura, one and another individual, Tagliente II from the north, share mitochondrial DNA patterns linked to Epigravetian Sicilians. These lineages, surprisingly, seem more connected to Elmiron Cave in Spain than to Central European groups like Goye Q2 in Belgium. The DNA of the Grotta del Mura baby, known as Lemura I, shows he was part of a small, isolated group of people who were likely closely related. He also shares DNA with later hunter-gatherers from Sicily, suggesting his group may have been their ancestors. However, scientists still need more DNA from other Epigravetian people in southern Italy to fully understand this story. Earlier studies show that during the Ice Age, people from different parts of southern Europe were connected. For example, a skeleton from El Miron in Spain shares more DNA with Lemura I and southern Italians than with people from northeastern Italy. This connection is even stronger with early Sicilians, pointing to a shared population that lived in southern Italy's warmer areas during the coldest parts of the Ice Age. Interestingly, there's no strong DNA connection between early Italian Epigravetians, like Lemura I or Tagliente II, and Magdalenian people from Western Europe. But later Italians, from after 17,000 years ago, do show more genetic similarity with Western Europeans, this may mean people began moving more between Italy and Western Europe after the Ice Age started to warm up. The Irene Candide Cave in northwestern Italy, known poetically as the Cavern of the White Sands, gave the world one of Europe's most enchanting burials. A 15-year-old Gravettian boy, now called the Giovanni Principe, the Young Prince, laid to rest around 23,500 years ago, he was buried with striking symbolism. His body, sprinkled in red and yellow ochre, was surrounded by a wealth of grave goods, a headdress made of shells and deer canines, mammoth ivory pendants, four ceremonial deer antler batons, and a flint blade, crafted from stone sourced hundreds of miles away in southeastern France. He faced south in burial, as if watching the horizon, and isotope analysis of his teeth reveals that marine fish made up a quarter of his diet, marking him as a coastal hunter. But this noble youth met a violent end. His jaw and shoulder show signs of trauma, possibly the result of a bear or large cat attack. Such burials were not unique. They represent a wider Gravettian culture that spanned Ice Age Europe and left behind not just graves but entire ways of life carved into stone, bone and gene. Decades earlier, in 1901, archaeologists had discovered two Upper Paleolithic skeletons in the Grimaldi Caves near the French-Italian border. These Grimaldi people stood out, more slender, with smaller statures and a different cranial morphology compared to the robust Cro-Magnons of France. Red ochre stained their bones, and they were buried in ceremonial positions, evoking both reverence and mystery. 
One intriguing feature was a Taurus palatinus, a bony ridge on the nose, found in the Grimaldi skulls, often seen in so-called primitive populations. This led early anthropologists to speculate that these people might have seen, even coexisted with, Neanderthals, and judged them harshly. The Grimaldi caves themselves held Mousterian layers, Neanderthal tools, beneath Aurignacian layers, marking the collision and succession of species. The remains are now recognized as representing two individuals, and are dated to possibly being of the same age as the five Cro-Magnon skeletons discovered by French paleontologist Louis Latte in 1868, and classified as part of the wider early European modern human population, formerly classified as Homo aurignaciensis. The Grimaldi skeletons were found in the lower Aurignacian layer in June 1901 by the Canon de Villeneuve. The two skeletons appeared markedly different from the Cro-Magnon skeletons found higher in the cave and in other caves around Balsirossi. The grotta held Aurignacian artifacts and reindeer remains in the upper layers, while the lower layers exhibited a more tropical fauna with Merck's rhinoceros, hippopotamus, and straight-tusked elephant. The lowermost horizon held Mousterian tools associated with Neanderthals. The men of the Grimaldi caves were as highly evolved as any modern people, and yet they may have seen, probably did see, the Neanderthal men and disliked the forbidding prominence of their simian brow ridges, Arthur Keith wrote in 1915. Yet even as genomes shifted, culture remained rich and strange. The Italian dead were laid with grave goods, red ochre and sacred adornments. Their dances and funerals alike were charged with meaning, life and death interwoven. Deep in Spain's Catalonia's La Roca del Moros cave, a rock painting from the same time frame as the Epigravetian expansion depicts a phallic dance. Nine bare-breasted women in skirts dance in a circle around a man with an enormous phallus. The fertility theme is unmistakable, as are the ritual and ecstatic overtones, and gives a tantalizing glimpse of their ancient culture. These sensual performances likely echoed real ceremonies, dances of courtship, fertility, and survival in a dangerous world. Though the cave lies in Spain, the cultural motifs may have been widespread, and similar rituals likely took place in the caves of Liguria, Apulia, and Sicily. Recent large-scale genomic analysis has fundamentally reshaped our understanding of these Ice Age Italians. A study led by an international team of scientists analyzing 356 prehistoric genomes reveals a dynamic, shifting continent. Between 35,000 and 5,000 years ago, groups associated with the Gravettian culture spread widely, but not uniformly. Populations in Western and Southwestern Europe, today's France and Iberia, appear genetically distinct from those in Central and Southern Europe. This cultural similarity, shared tools, art and burial practices, masked deep genetic differences, and crucially, Gravettian populations in Italy vanished after the last glacial maximum. They did not survive the brutal cold snap between 25,000 and 19,000 years ago. Instead, a new people with distinct DNA, linked to the Epigravetian culture, entered the peninsula, possibly from the Balkans, around the time of the glacial peak. By 14,000 years ago, these Epigravetian descendants were moving northward, replacing Magdalenian populations and leaving their genetic imprint across Europe. At that time, hunter-gatherers with distinct ancestries and appearances started to mix with each other. They were different in many aspects, including their skin and eye color, according to the study authors. It was long assumed that Italy, with its mild Mediterranean climate, was a refugium, a sanctuary, for Ice Age populations, but new genetic studies say otherwise. While southwestern Europe, particularly Iberia and southern France, did preserve Gravettian bloodlines, Italy saw a population collapse and replacement. Ancient Italy's genetic history is a tale of rupture and renewal. The Gravettians, once rulers of the peninsula, were swept away by the climate. Their places were taken by blue-eyed, brown-skinned Epigravettians, who came from the east and brought with them their own customs and genes. These people buried their young with care, danced by firelight, and painted their bodies with ochre. They lived hard lives in small bands, often in bread, clinging to coastlines and valleys as the glaciers receded. Some lineages survived, while others went extinct. Today, fragments of these people remain in the genomes of southern Europeans. 
their blue eyes, curled hair and skin tones still walk among us. Their flint tools rest in museums, their ochre-stained skeletons sleep beneath layers of time, and their stories, part scientific, part poetic, remind us of how fragile and beautiful human survival can be. In the caves of Ice Age Italy, ancient people left behind more than bones. They left a map of our origins, etched in DNA, burial and dance. The primary genes responsible for blue eyes are OCA2 and HERC2, which originated as long as 42,000 years ago, and not 8,000 years ago, as has been commonly cited from a 2008 study. Through the analysis of ancient DNA, a new study published in the journal Experimental Dermatology suggested that the specific genes for blue eye color likely originated in the Near East 42,000 years ago and arrived in Europe around 20,000 years ago, but different variations of this gene have existed for hundreds of thousands of years. This mutation for light-colored eyes most likely arose in the Caucasus region as much as 42,000 years ago. For the genes associated with light eye color, early Western European populations show high frequencies of the gene, which is responsible for the green or blue eyes. This gene was common in the Caucasus region at the time and spread west into Europe. There is evidence that as many as 16 different genes could be responsible for eye color in modern humans. However, the main two genes associated with eye color variation are OCA2 and HERC2, and both are localized in chromosome 15. A specific mutation within the HERC2 gene, a gene that regulates OCA2 expression, is partly responsible for blue eyes. Other genes implicated in eye color variation are SLC24A4 and TYR. Incredibly, recent tests indicate that both light and dark pigmentation genes at OCA2 and HERC2 have been segregating in the hominin lineage for hundreds of thousands of years. According to one often cited report, blue eye color in humans may be caused by a perfectly associated founder mutation in a regulatory element located within the HERC2 gene, inhibiting OCA2 expression. HERC2 is adjacent to OCA2, but even with whole genomes, scientists can't say very precisely what pattern of pigmentation was in ancient populations like the Neanderthals. The simplified explanation for blue eyes is that the OCA2 gene controls pigment in the stroma, the tissue and blood vessels of the iris, the colored part of the eye around the pupil. And the HERC2 gene is needed to help turn on the OCA2 gene to cause it to produce this pigment, resulting in brown eyes. If a person has a non-functioning OCA2 gene, they will always have blue eyes, because the HERK2 gene can't make the broken OCA2 gene work. Likewise, if a person has a HERK2 gene which doesn't work, the OCA2 gene will underachieve, failing to produce enough pigment to make brown eyes, resulting in blue eyes.